Welcome everyone and very glad that you could join us today. My name is Paula Newcomb and I'm the Northeast Regional Coordinator of the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. I will be the host and question moderator for today's webinar, Library Reopening Plans, presented by Mary Susi, the State Librarian of the North Dakota State Library. After the webinar has been transcribed, it will be available on the Indiana State Library's archived webinars page. If you are watching an archived recording of this presentation, information on how to obtain your LU is in the video's description in YouTube. For weekly updates on upcoming trainings and to learn more about what's happening in libraries across the state, please subscribe to the Indiana State Library's e-newsletter, The Wednesday Word. And be sure to check out our continuing education website for other professional development opportunities. So let's get started. I am now happy to turn the presentation over to Mary Susie. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Hopefully you can hear me okay. I just lost connection there for a few seconds, so hopefully that won't happen again. Um, as Paula said, please feel free to use the chat either to share your experiences or to ask questions. Um, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat as I'm sharing. So today we are going to do a really high level discussion on library reopening plans. As the country is slowly moving towards a new normal, and I don't know if you're like me, I'm kind of really not liking that term new normal anymore, but it's the one we have right now. So as we're slowly moving back towards whatever normal is going to look like, there'll be some long lasting impacts in how libraries operate. Some of the changes that we're implementing, the increased cleaning standards in particular, are things that we really sh probably should have been doing all along, something we'll continue doing, I think it's something that some of us were doing to some extent, but not to the great extent that we are now. We probably won't keep doing them to the same high degree that we are right now, but certainly more than many of us were doing. Today, we're going to have a high level discussion on the trends in the phased reopening plans and what the road ahead might include. I say might because things are continuing to change rapidly and flexibility is highly needed. So there are a number of trends, um, and the trends continue to change slightly as well um, as we learn more about the virus, as libraries are getting a better handle on what service in this current environment looks like, and as we're really starting to focus on what, is, what do libraries look like in the long term. I would say one universal trend across the country is increased digital resources. Libraries of all sizes are increasing, whether it's adding to their ebook collection. Um, there was just a discussion on the ARSL listserv, the Association for Rural and Small Libraries, about adding Hoopla or um, maybe Freegal, maybe you've added Universal Class, so Mango Languages, all kinds of different digital resources. Curbside pickup, contactless pickup, continue to be the norm for many libraries. And what I'm hearing in conversations that I'm having with librarians across the country and state librarians is that we we did curbside because it was a, a quick it was a quick response to the current uh, environment that we find ourselves living in. But it's been so well received by patrons that libraries plan to continue to use curbside. So I think that's one that will be here to stay. Some libraries have switched from calling it curbside to calling it contactless. So your patron pulls up, they pop their trunk, they open the side door of their van, they open the back door of their car or whatever. And then you put the items in, you never talk, you know, you never touch the patron, you certainly don't give them a hug. Um, I've heard a lot of librarians say that that's been a challenge, that their patrons want to interact with them more, and, you know, the please stay in your car works to some extent, but with some people it doesn't. Another trend around this is um, book bundles, so pulling together books by an author on a topic, kids' books, a certain genre, adults, pulling together DVD bundles, so you pull them all together, the patron comes in, 
you check them out and they go on their merry way. Or that you pull it together, they do the curbside pickup, you put them in the trunk and they go on their merry way. One of the libraries in North Dakota has transitioned and they've added online readers advisory. I'm really excited about this and to see how it works for them. So they created a Google form. Patrons give their name. They have to give some method of contact, be it email or phone. Um, and then they can choose as many genres as they like. They indicate how many books they'd like to have, two, four, ten, whatever. The librarians pull them together and create a bundle for them. And the patron comes in and picks the books up. Or, again, they offer curbside. That particular library is requiring masks from all people who enter the building. And so if a person doesn't want to wear a mask, or if they're unable to wear a mask for medical reasons, then they have the curbside option. So I'm just going to try again, try and watch the chat as well as we're going. So seeing some conversation about online resources, it looks like that's kind of the same thing. Oh, Lake County is doing Reader's Advisory through their Ask a Librarian. Awesome. I'd love to hear how that's going for you, Ingrid. Um, some of the other trends are the limits that we're imposing right now, uh, whether it's limited hours, limited number of people in the library, time limits on how long they can be in the library. Some libraries have added special hours for that risk population, similar to what we see a lot of stores and other businesses doing. So you don't stop someone from coming in between 9 and 10, um, but you advertise that it, that's the time for those high-risk populations. Many, many libraries have shut down their meeting rooms or their small study rooms. Computer labs are limited. Computer labs are maybe shut down completely. Um, it may be that you have less computers in service. That's what we've done here at the State Library. We're open daily uh, from 8 to 12, any walk-ins, but we're limiting the number of people that can be in the building at one time. From noon to 5, it's by appointment only, and we will do curbside on request. We only have two computers up and running right now. One is limited to 15 minutes at a time. The other is limited to unemployment or employment, you know, if they're filling out employment applications, unemployment, um, immigration-related services, so very targeted types. Um, mainly, we're trying to limit our computer usage here because we're on the state capital grounds to state capital business. So somebody's going to DOT to get a driver's license, they need to print off a form, they run down, they print off the form, that kind of thing. Um, Paul, I think that's a great question. Our time limits changing as schools are back in session. In the conversations that I've heard, um, time limits and computers are, seem to be increasing some. So maybe going from a half hour back to your normal hour. But then it's an hour a day, not an hour at a time. Um, other services that might be limited um, include... Um, or other things that might have changed, sorry, rather not limited, are um, we're not encouraging lingering right now. And that, I think, might be one of the toughest change for librarians. So, um, you know, we've taken away the chairs from our tables or we've limited to one or two chairs from our tables. A couple of our academic libraries here in North Dakota have said they've left two chairs at the table, one chair that's a little more comfortable and then the other chair for students to drop their bag and all their stuff in. Um, social distancing from staff and other patrons. Many, many libraries across the country have put barriers in at their circulation and their other public services desk, the most common one being plexiglass. But I've seen other solutions as well that people are using. Um, and then many libraries are encouraging come in, do a quick check-in and a check-out kind of a thing. One of the things that we talked about yesterday in our weekly library community meeting is how are you handling teens and kids after school? You know, typically libraries are a hangout place for those kids. A lot of parents say to their kids, okay, go to the library after school and I'll pick you up. And so how, and how are you handling that 
now that you have limited hours, limited space, limited people in the building, if anybody has a great solution to that, I would love to see it in chat so that I can share that with our librarians here in North Dakota. So I see Karen says they're starting story time. If disinfected, can you put out puzzles for the kids in the train set? I would say based on what our libraries are doing, what I'm hearing libraries across the country are doing, Karen, many libraries are not putting out their toys and that kind of, you know, puzzles and those sorts of manipulatables or manipulatives. Um, because again, they're not encouraging people to stay and that putting out the trains and the puzzles and those kinds of things encourage people to stay. If your library has room where people can spread out and social distance and you have the ability to sanitize after, I would say very much that's totally up to you um, on whether or not you want to do that. But I'd love to see some feedback in the chat from how other people are handling that. Uh, Ingrid says they've notified schools on what they can provide and what they can't, and I think that is great. Um, one of the state librarians, we had a state librarian meeting yesterday, and one of the state librarians said, I think it was in Delaware, their school, their library, one library in particular has been super proactive and has reached out to the school and said, not only here's what we can and can't provide, but we can also provide space for you because we have this meeting room or whatever, and so if you need to have students meet here, here's what we can do. So I encourage you to think about not only what we can't provide, but let's look at it from a positive of what are the things we can do and how can, you know, how can we continue to serve our community in new and innovative ways. Digital cards, that's a great question, Paula. That is one that I am seeing on a lot of the lists that I'm on are the digital cards for students. A lot of libraries are uh, using those now. Another one that to me is, is still a little iffy, but a lot of our small one-person libraries here in North Dakota, we have a lot of one- and two-person libraries, and they have closed their restrooms to the public. And the reason for doing that is they don't have the ability to sanitize in between patrons. Um, our restrooms are open because we're on the Capitol grounds. We're a little different. We have to follow the facilities management guidelines. We can't just make the determination to close or not close our restroom. And if you are thinking of doing that, I do encourage you to talk to the library or city attorney, whoever you use for an attorney before you do that. Um, cause it's very state code might direct what you can and can't do. I know in Illinois, we were not allowed to close our public restrooms here in North Dakota. They've all been allowed to do that. Um, but what we've done here at the state libraries, we have a sign up over our water fountain that's set, because it's also a water filling station and we just, a bottle filling station. We have a sign up that says not sanitized. You know, it's not sanitized very often. We have a sign in our bathrooms that say sanitized once a day. And then it's up to people if they want to use it or not. Erica asked, should you focus on digital versus physical resources? That's what a lot a lot of libraries are focusing very heavily on their digital, but I'm also hearing from a lot of libraries that they are focusing on their physical, Erica, because that's what our patrons want from us. They're craving those physical items. They're craving those quick interactions, you know, with us. Um, one of our libraries here in North Dakota, she's a one-person library, very small community. She is a city-county library, but her county has less than a thousand people or around a thousand people. And she has a group of boys who come in all the time to use her two computers. She has her computers extremely limited. She's not allowing kids to use the computers at all right now. And uh, she had a group of her boys come in the other day wearing their masks. And she said, guys, I'm so sorry. The computers are still really limited. And they said, that's OK. We're not here to use the computers. We missed you. We wanted to visit with you. And she's like, oh, thank you. And so her meeting room had been set up for her library board meeting the day before. The chairs were all socially distanced, six feet apart. And so this group of four middle school age boys went back in her meeting room and sat and chatted with her. And then they sat in there and played on their phones and just visited with one another. And she thought that was totally awesome. And I actually really love that story. So um, I love the things you guys are sharing in chat. So a month for Karen before story time. Uh, Janice works at a school library twice a month, so not enough time, definitely not enough time. 
Um, Janice, that's a great question about the platforms for uh, virtual programs. And I, we're going to talk about virtual programs in a second. Um, let me finish getting through my trends, and then I'll transition to the next one, which is, is programs. Um, the other thing that libraries are dealing with is the book drop. Some libraries are requiring all items be returned via the book drop only, then they can grab them and they can quarantine them. Some libraries have closed their book drops and only are allowing in-person. Um, I think that was more common, it's still common in the libraries that are doing curbside only. A lot of libraries have transitioned to find free. That is one of the trends I'm most excited about. Libraries might transition back to finds after we reopen and get kind of back into our normal group, but I'm hoping more libraries really examine how Find Free went for them and really consider going Find Free. We could do a whole nother session on Find Free and why you should do it, and I'm not here to jam that down your throat. I'll just throw it out as something to think about. Um, and then the quarantining of materials. If you are not following the Realm trial, R-E-A-L-M, Realm is a is a partnership between the Institute for Museum and Library Services, IMLS, uh, OCLC, and then a lab in Ohio, uh, it starts with a B. And they are running trials of how long the virus lasts on specific, specifically on library items. Um, and so they did find that on board books, there were traces of the virus after the three days. So the recommendation is that you quarantine board books for four days. Um, other things can be quarantined for less. So if you haven't followed the Realm trial, I would suggest just Google Realm, IMLS Realm. Um, I would suggest you go to their website and sign up for their emails and get information. And then of course, the biggest trend for everyone is sanitizing, 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 materials, surfaces, everything we can, you know, everything that patrons touch. So virtual programs, let's jump right into it. Um, so many libraries are offering virtual programs only, and I'm seeing a lot of libraries that are saying they're going to be virtual for the rest of this year. I've seen libraries that have said they're going to be virtual already into next year. Um, a lot of libraries flip to online summer reading program. A lot of virtual story times. Some libraries are doing them live. Some are doing them pre-recorded. Now, one trend that I am seeing, um, especially among our smaller libraries, but even our one, our second largest library here in Bismarck is doing it, and that is out time, outdoor story time. I think we are at that point where we are just craving interaction with other human beings outside our little pod circles, and so a lot of libraries are now offering story times outdoors where people can socially distance, they don't come too close. You, you know, you read your stories, you do your songs, people have a chance to be with other people, but not that close. So that's, a, I think, a temporary trend, at least here, of course, in North Dakota, and certainly in parts of Indiana. Um, all too quickly, it's gonna get cold, it's gonna get snowy, it's gonna get icy, very snowy for us, and very, very cold, and so outdoor story time will be a fond remembrance in the short term. But while you can do it, it's certainly one way to do it. Um, other things that I've seen are discussion groups, are cropping up different discussion groups, um, certainly with what's going on across the country with the social unrest, um, racial justice. There's a lot of opportunities for libraries to be in that playing field and leading conversations in their community, whether it's doing a racial injustice or a diversity book club or a discussion group. One, a fun one that one of our libraries here in North Dakota is doing, the Dickinson Public Library, it's the Podcast Brunch Club. And the Podcast Brunch Club, it's a, it's a program that you, I think, subscribe to, in essence. Um, they put together a, a selection of podcasts. The people in the podcast club listen to which ones they want, and then they come together once a month to discuss what they listen to. So... Not everyone is listening to the exact same podcast, but they're all listening to podcasts on a specific topic. It sounds like a really fun, easy program to manage, and they said it was not um, an expensive one. Another one that I've heard about, and this one, again, I love the idea of, it's very old school. Um, some of you may be old enough to remember when we used to have dial a story or 
um, you know, used to have the dial of Santa Claus and, you know, you would dial the Santa Claus and your kids would hear a personalized Santa message. So you dial a story, you know, you dial a number, you hear a story read to you. The, the reason I love this particular library that's doing it is they're doing it for their senior population. So the folks that are in the nursing homes and the care centers and the senior communities who are really, really craving this contact because a lot of our nursing homes still aren't allowing people to visit or it's very limited visits. Um, this gives seniors a way to still interact with people. I would love to see in the chat what other types of programs you guys are doing online. Um, in terms of platforms, there's different platforms. Some people, a lot of people are using Facebook Live for theirs. If you are doing story time programming, I really encourage you, look at the different publishers. Some publishers have given blanket permission to do online live story time with their books. Some are not. I just realized my chat didn't move down. Sorry about that, guys. Let me look real quick to see if there were any questions asked. Um, Zoom is is very much another very popular one. There's a lot of um, security features that Zoom has put in place now to so that you don't get Zoom bombed. My number one tip is someone who was Zoom bombed very early on. Um, it was horrific, but um, is don't share your link broadly. Don't just throw your link up on your Facebook page or your website. If you if you want to share your link, um, you can share a registration link because the people that want to Zoom bomb aren't registering and signing up that way. Um, just trying to see, what did Mindy say? Oh, great. So Mindy has an in-house guide about how to safely create a meeting, avoid Zoom bombing, incorporate Zoom with the event software platform. That's awesome. And Paula shared the information about uh, from Web Junction about some COVID stuff. There's also a lot of state libraries that have put together lib guides around COVID stuff. I, I'm assuming Indiana State Library has done something as well, so you can check your state library for information that way also. Oh, Facebook Live cuts off after 15 minutes. Hmm. I haven't heard of that problem, Janice. When, when to transition to indoor programming, uh, looking at the infection rates? That, Ingrid, that is a great question, and that is definitely one of the things that you want to look at. You also want to take your guide from what your city or county offices are doing. So is the city open for business? You know, is the county open for business? Um, what are your schools doing? One of our librarians in our meeting yesterday shared that uh, um, one of our staff members in library development has been checking with her libraries and a lot of them are waiting to see what the schools are doing and one of our library directors who has several educators on her board said don't wait to see what the schools are doing they don't need the burden of knowing you're waiting for them but also the schools are on under different funding and different they have different legal structures to follow than the libraries do. So figure out what works for your library and then let the schools know how you can help them, as somebody said earlier. Um, Zoom is good for 45 minutes. That Yes, Jennifer, if you're using the free Zoom, it's good for 45 minutes. Sometimes they've, they've extended that. Um, I don't know if they're still doing that blanket extension or not. So, yeah, you're definitely, you want to make sure that um, you test that before you put it out there for a program. What are some of the other uh, types of virtual programs that you guys have have done? I'm just going to wait a second. I see multiple people are typing. I don't think I missed any other questions in the chat, but if I do, um, we will have a, a question and answer at the end. So if I missed, I should have said this at the beginning, my apologies. If I missed your question in the chat, um, please, you know, jump in at the end during Q&A time and retype it. So teen book club, anime club, online games. Oh, the online games is a really fun one. I've seen a number of libraries that are doing that, Christy. That's awesome. Um, we had an online 
week-long summer reading statewide, statewide summer reading kickoff. And one of our libraries did bingo, online bingo. So that was really fun. Um, art classes, that's another really popular one. And um, some organizations, not necessarily libraries, are doing the art classes as a fundraiser. So I'd be interested to hear if any libraries have done that. The monthly book club. Uh, oh, story walk. Yes, Paula, that's a really common one. Um, in store windows, we had one library, I thought this was really cool, that did the story walk on their library grounds to sort of direct traffic when people came out of the building to help from people from queuing up and getting too close. The story walk took them around the building and kind of a, it was a longer route, but it was a way to leave the building without having people bunching up. I thought that was great. A lot of libraries have been doing this, the um, story walks, and I hope libraries continue doing that. Children's cooking and adults paint by number. Oh, for fun, Mary. I love these ideas. Origami demonstrations online, ESL classes. Trivia, yes, trivia is another one that has flipped online. Local history, um, Kahoot trivia challenges, virtual teen advisory board, virtual author, author visits. It, this is a great time to be connecting with authors. Armchair travel. Susan, I'd love to hear more about that. Keep sharing these ideas, guys. These are so awesome, and I am, I am taking a lot of them. Um, I, I write a monthly column for our newsletter, and um, I am, I'm behind on this month's column, so I'm going to be copying this chat down because it may give me some great ideas. So keep sharing those ideas on virtual programs. We're going to shift a little bit to what does the future look like in libraries. And of course, nobody really knows, right? But um, I th here's what I think the future looks like in some of the research that I've done. Continued increased sanitizing. I think that goes without saying. We're going to continue to wipe down our tables, our surfaces, our computers. Um, here's a tip for your computers. Maybe you've already heard this. When I first heard it, I was like, really? That's what we're going to do, but I'll tell you what, we're doing it here at the State Library because it is a really cheap solution. Um, if you need a solution for your public library keyboards, press and seal is the answer. It is cheap. It's easy to get your hands on it. You put a piece of press and seal over the, the keyboard. It's, you can still type through it. Patron leaves. You rip it off, put another piece. From an ecological standpoint, I realize that's not the best option. But from a library standpoint, where we have limited resources and we're trying to protect our patrons to the best of our ability, you know, uh, in, in the most economical way possible, press and seal is a great answer. Activities and resource pages on the State Library website, that's great. Paula, I love that. Um, we, will, we will take a look at that here at the State Library and share, point some of our libraries in that direction as well. Mary, I'm glad to hear there's another library using Press and Seal. Um, I have to give credit to, it was a library in one of the ARSL talks that shared the idea. So um, not our idea by any, any means. Uh, another trend I think that's here to stay is the plexiglass or other sneeze guards on desks. I think we're going to keep those up. Um, smaller programs. I think once we do transition back into live programs, they will be smaller. I don't think we're going to be doing, you know, like we used to do a summer reading celebration on the state capitol grounds with our two of our local libraries. We'd have 3,000 people come through. I just don't know that that's in our future. Or if it is, not for a couple of years. Uh, Janice uses press and seal and sandwich bags for the mice. I've heard that idea as well, Janice. So I, I'm glad to hear that that's a good, sol cheap solution also. Um, a lot of libraries are looking at their policies right now. So they're updating their patron behavior policy. They're updating meeting room policies. They're updating their computer policies. You know, like I said, the time limits, the people limits, the time limits maybe in the building. Um, if meeting rooms are being used, what changes have you implemented? Who's responsible for sanitizing? You know, meeting room policies have always said you have to leave the room basically how you how you got it or cleaner, right? So if you if you use our meeting room, it's on you to clean it up. But um, now, who's going to sanitize the meeting room after it's been used? And do you have to space it out so that Group A rents it on Monday, Group B can't rent it then until Thursday? 
because you have to, you know, you want to have that quarantine time. Disaster policies, absolutely, Paula. Um, I think we've all realized that even if we thought we had pandemic policies, we they weren't enough. They weren't sufficient enough. And uh, just as an aside, Paula, if you guys have done disaster policy training or know someone who's a good resource for that, shoot me an email. I'd love to have a name. Another another trend that I think will is has started and will be here to stay. And uh, interestingly enough, I I found this in architecture journal. Um, architects are talking about libraries right now, which is fascinating to me. Um, so movable, flexible furniture. Uh, in some ways, that makes my, my old librarian heart a little sad because there's something really satisfying about walking into a library and sitting down at one of those sturdy wood library tables and just, oh, yes, you know. But, but realistically, flexible tables flexible furniture that we can move together or move apart for easy social distancing or you know tables that go up for teens and down for uh, adults or however you know up for adults and down for kids so movable flexible furniture I think you're going to see a lot of libraries um, doing laptops in the future for their computers versus desktops it gives us it gives us the option to have patrons move around it's easier to social distance a laptop than a than um, a desktop it's also easy to say to a patron here check out this Chromebook and you can use it in the parking lot you never have to come into the building once you check it out and you can access all of our digital resources so that if you don't want to wear a mask in our building and we're requiring it you can still access all the library stuff uh, Michelle Stricker is a great great resource for the um, for disaster policies thank you Courtney for that reminder uh, another I think re um, another thing in the future and that we mentioned in trends but I think you're going to continue to see libraries um, increase their digital resources you're going to continue to see an increase in ebooks but I don't think we're ever going to fully move away from physical items um, we have some libraries here that have, you know, maker, mobile maker spaces, if you will. I don't know if that's really quite the right term to use. So they have tools that they check out. They're continuing to check them out. They just have a different procedure for sanitizing them. Um, the State Library of North Dakota, uh, through a partnership with the one of the Air Force bases, the Grand Forks Air Force Base, we have about 60 STEM kits that we circulate, and we're not circulating them right now. We will circulate them again in the future, but I foresee that we're going to look to the future STEM kits that we buy through a slightly different lens, and we're going to look to buy ones that are easier uh, to sanitize. Library of Things. Thank you, Aaron. That is the term that my brain was not coming up with. Um, so I would love to see what what you think the future of libraries is going to look like. What you know, and if there's trends that you've spotted that we haven't already highlighted, toss those also in chat. You guys have been great in chat with sharing. Um, so I I forgot to put in my Q and A slide. I thought there was one in there. My apologies on that, Paula. But now we're at the Q and A part of the presentation. So what questions do you have for me or for your colleagues? Please type them in chat, and I'll do my best to answer them, or other people can jump in and answer as well. Laura says a library of things webinar next week. Oh, there's a great, thank you. I'm going to, I am going to definitely sign up for that because um, we actually are going to do a library of things grant. We were going to do it this fall, but um, we're going to do it in the future now. Grab and go in the future. Nick, thank you for mentioning that. Um, that is definitely one of the trends. It's definitely, it goes on virtual programming. It goes on the future slide. Absolutely. Um, grab and go. I've seen some libraries call them take and makes instead of make and takes. So you put basically a program in a bag. You, you either provide all of the, the supplies or you choose crafts or programs that people are likely to have the supplies at home, like crayons or markers or whatever. Um, those are incredibly popular with all size libraries. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Nick, for mentioning that. 
how to bring patrons back oh gosh that that's a really great question um, what I've seen, Ingrid, and what I've heard a lot of libraries talking about that have opened, and here in North Dakota, a lot of our libraries have opened. Um, some of our libraries have been told by their local attorney or their state's attorney that they can require masks, but they have to provide them. Some of our libraries have been told they can request masks, they can't require them. So again, that's one to talk to your attorney about. Um, but certainly masking up is one. Um, the, the, the one common theme that I'm seeing across the country for libraries that have reopened or partially reopened um, is limiting the number of people that can be in your building. Number one, that's the number one thing. The other really, really common trend is by appointment only. So people can make an appointment to come in and use the computer. People can make an appointment to come in and check out books. Um, there's not a lot of browsing going on right now in libraries. Um, there is some browsing. And there's a lot of discussion about that right now in the library world, right? Can we allow our patrons to browse? And I liken it to the grocery store. We, we, some people only do online shopping now, absolutely. And that's awesome. Um, I'm kind of old school. I prefer to pick out my own fruit and veggies. But when I go into the grocery store or I go into Walmart or Target or Sam's, I do a weekly Sam's Walmart grocery store run, I don't know if the items that I picked up were picked up by someone before me. So when I get home and I unload my groceries, I wash my hands. I feel it's kind of the same in libraries. You know, if people want to browse, they need to know we cannot possibly sanitize everything. So the one, the one caution I would share, certainly share with your patrons that you are taking steps to make the library a safer place. I would not say we are making the library safe because we just can't sanitize every single thing. Um, Janice, you make a great point, homebound. Uh, home deliveries some some libraries are just doing flat out doing deliveries and surprisingly it's a lot of our one and two person libraries and a lot of them are doing contactless delivery so they contact the patron we're coming to drop off your stuff they drop it on the porch they ring the bell and they go back to their car and they never interact with the patron or they ring the bell they wait till the patron opens the door they, you know, they step back, if they're, they say hello, they do their social distancing, they wear their masks, and then they go back to the car. So that is definitely um, another trend, I think. I don't know if that one will be here to stay long term because that's a hard one to manage, but I think it might be. Uh, grocery stores, restaurants, home repair have been super busy. They have been here as well, Paula. Uh, mostly close to the public due to construction and renovation but the grab-and-go and appointments. Um, Ingrid, I think some patrons are scared of libraries and some are not. I think that that varies a lot by person, and I think it also varies some by area. So here in North Dakota, um, we started reopening May 6th. I think we, were, we never fully shut down. We shut down about 80%. We started reopening. Our libraries were never shut down by our governor. It was a case-by-case -case basis. We had some libraries that stayed open the whole time. Um, and then we have other libraries that have since opened. We had one library that they were one of our last to open. They opened for curbside only. They were open for three days. A staff member tested positive. They had to shut back down, sanitize, 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 and their whole staff quarantined for the two weeks. Um, I will say what I am hearing from libraries that have reopened is they are definitely much slower. So I think definitely there is fear, not just of libraries, fear in general, um, but our libraries that are open in North Dakota and, and librarians that I've talked to across the country and what I'm hearing from my state library colleagues is that it's slowly increasing. People are slowly coming back to the library but it's different. They come in, they find their books, they check out, they leave. 
they don't stand in chit chat they don't you know it's just not the same and it may not be the same for a really long time um, Nick that's a that's a great point that our online holds were sort of online shopping and I don't know that we have really honed into that language, but it certainly would be a fun, uh, kind of a fun way to do that, right? Um, way more popular now with folks just coming in to pick up their holds and leaving. I think self-checkout is another trend, um, whether it's true self-checkout where the patron is completely contactless, or it's we now have two barcode readers, one pointing out and one pointing at the desk, and um, and then staff, you know, open the computer or whatever, and patrons scan their own books. So there's different levels of self-checkout that libraries have used. So Janice's homebound employees have a library purchase cell phone, and they call the person when their books are delivered. That's a great idea if your library can afford it. Absolutely. Summer reading was a third of the normal for participation, but higher completion. And that's really interesting, Erin, because I'm hearing that from a lot of libraries. Less people participated, but those that did were more likely to finish. I think that's, that's real common across, across library land. And so I think we have to maybe ask ourselves, what does that mean? And, and how do we incorporate that knowledge for the future? Definitely. I'm seeing some others that are um, chiming in, Aaron, that that was their experience also. And uh, I, I agree, Janice, that's great to look for the positive. Great way to, to share the positive. So I see some other people are typing. And again, if you have other questions, I'm happy to try and answer them or happy to you know, see what your colleagues have to say. You guys have shared some great ideas in the chat. So Ingrid says they have a callback program where patrons can leave a voicemail and then um, they still have that and patrons are leaving them voicemail at 2 a.m. on a Sunday. Wow, that's really great. Um, as long as you don't have to listen to it at 2 a.m. on a Sunday, I would say. That's really, really great. You guys, you guys are doing such awesome, awesome things um, in Indiana libraries. Very cool. I, one thing I will say, um, and I, I've been a librarian for about 26 years, so I've long known that librarians are some of the most creative, versatile, flexible, innovative, amazing creatures on the earth. Um, but I've been so, so impressed during this last couple of months at the way libraries have just really changed how they do things, how they're serving their patrons, how they're serving their staff. Um, if they're lucky enough to have one, I'm I'm in a state, like I said, where there's a lot of one and two person libraries. So um, staff uh, staff morale is definitely an issue, Paula, that we all need to be worried about. Um, folks that you know are working from home and might need that collect that connection that they're isolated. Um, Yes, accessing your voicemail remotely would be a great thing to have in your back pocket, Janice, for sure. Um, tips for building and keeping staff morale up. Well, for those of you who are lucky enough to be in a larger library with staff and may have been lucky enough to have staff telecommuting, finding ways to connect with staff, whether it's you know a Zoom meeting, a, a phone call, um, those connections are super, super important. Um, treats, treats are always good. That's always good, especially in library land, Susan. We all like our treats, right? Um, rotating schedule, distributed workload, that's important. Um, I would say the other, for, for my staff, um, our, we, our staff are all in Bismarck, all working in the state library. Um, our state has now flipped to, um, 
teleworking as a new norm. And so we have some staff that telework a portion of their time and a portion of their time in the building. And with schools just announcing now that they're going to be hybrid, two days in person, two days at home, our staff had a lot of anxiety about um, what does that mean for me. And so we just had a staff meeting this morning. It was a short 30-minute staff meeting. We talked about what options are for people who have to telecommute, and we answered questions. I think sharing information. The other big question that our staff have is, you know, what happens if someone does get COVID? So we're having a staff meeting next week. Remotely, we have Microsoft Teams to answer questions and share what our COVID protocol is. Um, I've started doing something about once or twice a week called Tidbits, where I send information to the whole staff um, just about what's going on, but also just, you know, if I see an interesting article, I share stuff from the realm. Um, so just, you know, keeping those connections um, is a really important chat feature. Um, if you have chat, that's great, Susan. Um, phone systems send you an email with a recording of voicemails. Oh, that's cool, Austin. I'll have to see if ours does that. We did. We we actually have done a couple of staff potlucks um, where we socially distanced, and um, but it was again a chance for staff to come together and just you know interact a little bit. I've heard of Discord, Paula. I don't know anything about it. So if somebody knows Discord or um, or uh, what's the other one, Slack. I think some libraries are using Slack as well. Um, Yes, if you have a friends group, maybe. Um, inform before the public knows. That would be great, Ingrid, for sure, if you can do that. Um, very, very important. That is a, that's probably the number one tip. Very awesome. Um, one of the other things we, we allowed when we first went to work from home and staff were struggling, um, we allowed staff to read for 20 minutes a day, and then um, they had to write up a book review and give it to our marketing person to use in, in, in a future um, newsletter. We also allow staff to listen to the governor's weekly press conference, and they can do that on paid time as well. We were doing Zoom meetings for a while, too, and, and um, sort of connecting just trying to give staff ways to connect so we would have a topic, you know, share your favorite vacation or, you know, just different topics. I think Zoom meetings were pretty common for people. Other questions that you have that we haven't yet answered or other tips that you want to share with your colleagues? One other that I heard, um, one library, um, I've heard of a couple libraries, not just one library, um, checking with patrons. So patrons that you know that live alone that might not be having a lot of staff contact or patrons that you know who are at risk, because we all know our patrons share things with us that sometimes we're like, mm, we don't need to know that. But um, reaching out to those patrons, just checking with them, seeing if there's, you know, if, if they want if you're offering delivery, do they want books delivered or letting them know ways they can, you know, do curbside or whatever, or just check in and say, I was thinking about you and I hope you're doing well. Um, I love that idea as well. Personal touch with patrons is so important, Paula. Oh, Austin, that's a great question. So what are libraries doing with their discards? Are they still selling or donating? Um, I've seen that handled a couple of different ways. Um, the most common one I've seen 
is um, libraries aren't doing book, they aren't selling them necessarily, but they put books out on a cart and then just tell people to take them and not bring them back. Um, we actually have a library here, Paula, their friends group are taking books. We have a couple of community events that are still going on and so they're uh, their friends group are taking the book sales out in the community to, at outside events where social distancing is an option. Um, I would say the other question our libraries have, and, and if somebody has a, an idea, I'd love to see it again, um, is how are you handling fundraising? And that's when I don't have, have a, a lot of um, good answers for. So. So offering books up on the statewide library email list serve, that's great. One of our libraries does that as well, Janice. Um, Better World Books is a great opportunity if you're signed up with them. Some libraries have to scan their books and Better World will tell them which ones they'll take. And I've heard some libraries don't have to do that, so I think it varies. There is another service out there besides Better World Books and the name is escaping me right now. Um, they're usually at ALA, though. I'm not. Is, what is Discover Books, Jennifer? Is that kind of like a Better World Books? Okay, I'm going to write that one down. Oh, B&T has a new program to buy books from libraries? I'm not familiar with that, Deborah. That's cool. B&T will come to the library and pick them up, or Discover Books does? Okay, so I see in the chat, Discover doesn't pay for them, but they pick them up. Better World Book provides free shipping and they pay if they can sell them, I think is how that works. Some prison libraries will take them. That's a great point, Laura. They do usually have um, some pretty strict guidelines for what they will take. So I see there's a couple more people adding comments in the chat. If there are no final questions, I will turn it back over to Paula. I know she has some closing housekeeping duties. So I just want to thank you, Paula, and everyone that participated today. This has been oh, great yes, Mary. This has information been very, very sharing. And I hope and again, hopefully also, what I shared was helpful. To you and to everybody participating in the chat today. Like I said, I will make sure I copy that and send that to everyone. Um, just doing a quick reminder, if you are watching an archived recording of this presentation, information on how to obtain your LEU is in the video's description in YouTube. We will now stop recording.